Hello, and uh, welcome to another explosive webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Rufus Kamau, Market Analyst at FX Pesa. So today, we are going to have a crucial discussion, and these will be focused on commodity shortages. So we are going to take a wider look at a uh, majority of the commodities in the markets uh, with key focus on gold as well as oil prices. And once we get to understand this, then we will have a way for uh, getting an edge in the market while you are trading oil as well as gold in the markets. <clears throat> so kindly be patient. Uh, let's wait for a couple of minutes, uh, maybe three minutes as uh, we see more people join. And once they join, then we can uh, proceed uh, with the session. <clears throat> So I want you to consider this an uh, interactive session. So if you have any que questions or comments as the session uh, progresses, uh, feel free to type those questions or comments in the live comment section. And I'll be responding to those questions uh, as they come or towards the end of the session. So <clears throat> let's get uh, started right away. So uh, the main topic for today, as mentioned, is commodity shortages. Uh, we will be looking at metals and what is happening in metals. Uh, we will be looking at energy and what's happening in energy, as well as uh, what is happening in commodity, uh, agricultural commodities. So let's begin with a quick uh, introduction. And uh, this is uh, in regard to a case that happened during the COVID period. So uh, this was uh, in reference to microchips. The semiconductor industry's uh, crisis a uh, period uh, forced producers to invest in capacity and buyers to purchase buffer stock. So whenever you hear of a commodity shortage, you know that uh, any participant in the market, uh, that is the buyers, uh, will look to secure supply. And in that case, they will buy the commodities in bulk, put that in storage to ensure that they have uh, the necessary commodity reserves to serve them for a period of time. So while this may apply very well in uh, oil and uh, metals, it may not apply very well uh, for other commodities that tend to expire within a short period of time, uh, such as corn, soybean, and so on. So <clears throat> the semiconductor industry is now entering a period of oversupply, leading procurement teams to assess whether the next wave of disruption uh, will come from, or where the disruption uh, for the next, uh, let's say, one, two, three, five years will come from. So <clears throat> during that period, uh, when there was uh, shortages in semiconductors, some of the best performing stocks in the S&P 500 were in the semiconductor industry. And this includes uh, stocks such as uh, NVIDIA. Uh, we saw AMD making some really good gains. Uh, we also had other candidates such as uh, Applied Materials and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Intel, among others. So. Today, we'll be looking at something similar. Yes, uh, you probably participated in this and made some money, but then if you missed, then you should know that there is another opportunity, especially with uh, what is being expected in terms of our uh, commodity shortages this year and also looking into some part of next year. So in today's uh, presentation, I'll be doing an introduction. Uh, we look at metals, energies, agricultural commodities, and some fundamentals before we end with the conclusion. So let's start with the introduction right here. So commodities are primarily traded uh, on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the US, uh, Intercontinental Commodity Exchange or the ICE in the US, Canada, and Europe, 
uh, in Asia, it's majorly the Japan Exchange Group. And then in London, we have the London Metal Exchange or the LME. So commodity shortages often lead to higher respective prices and they usually take longer to fix. So if uh, you ever hear that there's a commodity shortage, uh, then in most cases, it will take at least a year or two before that problem is fixed. Case in point, uh, we know that uh, some good part of 2021, uh, we had uh, some uh, shortages in oil. <clears throat> and then the problem became worse in 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine and sanctions were implemented, and also the Nord Stream uh, pipeline was bombed. So uh, this shortage led to higher prices in oil, and it has taken a long time to push prices back to normal. So in this case, we should be expecting something similar in uh, all other commodities. So the most recent commodity shortage was the semiconductor chips in 2020 and 2021. And it led to a strong rally in semiconductor stocks, such as uh, NVIDIA, Intel, and applied materials. So today, the world is faced with commodity shortages, especially in uh, food supply lines, uh, lithium, oil, natural gas, coal, as well as uh, vegetable oils. Commodity shortages often lead to higher inflation. So we all know this. Uh, in Kenya, we experienced this. <clears throat> when there was a shortage of oil, then all prices went higher. And uh, there was a ripple effect where the other products that depend on oil prices also went higher and the cost of living eventually went higher. So that's a natural consequence whenever there's uh, commodity shortages happening across board. <coughs> Critical commodities sometimes will pressure governments to offer subsidies. Uh, we saw it happening in Kenya and uh, I'll be expecting something similar to be happening in uh, other countries. So let's look at uh, what a commodity is defined as uh, so that we can work within the appropriate environment. So commodities are raw materials or primary products that are sold in the global financial markets. Uh, they are classified as follows. <coughs> One, we have what we call minerals. Minerals are basically commodities that are dug from the ground. This refers to commodities that are mined, such as uh, gold and oil, and uh, mineral commodities can be classified into two. On one side, you have metals, and on the other hand, we have energies. So metals include gold, silver, copper, iron ore, cobalt, lithium, and uranium, among others. Whereas when you talk of energies, uh, we are looking at fossil fuels, such as crude oil, natural gas, coal, and processed gas, which is uh, basically petrol. So sometimes scrap metal is uh, classified as a mineral, though it is not mined from the ground. So the other classification is what we call agricultural commodities. And this refers to unprocessed products from, uh, of farms, ranches, uh, nurseries, and forests, and natural and man-made bodies of water that the independent producer has cultivated, raised, or harvested with legal access rights. Uh, they include corn, sugar, uh, soya beans. We have cotton, cattle, milk, coffee, lumber, and uh, also cocoa. So <clears throat> these are not the only commodities in the market. Uh, there are other unclassified commodities, such as what we call plastics, as well as a uh, fertilizer. So all these uh, span a very wide market that is consumed globally, and they serve as primary products for manufacturing, or as food, uh, directly uh, for consumption. And uh, for instance, gold is uh, for, used for uh, store of value, whereas other minerals such as uh, iron are used for manufacturing. <clears throat> so let's get right into it and uh, look at energies. The latest oil market uh, report from the International Energy Agency, which was out this Wednesday, forecast that global oil demand will increase by 1.9 million barrels per day in 2023 to reach a record 101.7 million barrels per day. So <clears throat> with nearly half, half of that demand coming from China, the agency meanwhile expects oil supply growth to slow to 1 million barrels per day in that same period. And this is coming from CNBC. So the reopening of China this year is expected to boost oil demand, while the expansion of India's manufacturing is expected to ramp up the demand. 
The supply spare capacity is expected to experience stress, and this could lead to higher crude oil prices. So we all know that China uh, had, has been uh, under lockdown for approximately three years. Uh, they recently reopened uh, the country in December by eliminating all COVID-19 policies and eventually uh, moving from zero COVID policy to a policy where they acknowledge that they can live uh, with the disease. So when they did this, there was an expectation that the economy would start recovering and uh, this is already happening. Uh, manufacturing and factory conditions are already expanding, uh, basically implying that China is on the rise again. So China is the world's biggest uh, importer of oil. So if uh, the country has re resumed production, then we expect high demand from China, which would uh, basically drive prices higher, considering that the supply side has not expanded as much. So. Well, Aramco is working on building additional uh, production capacity. I don't think it is enough investment to bring additional capacity that will be needed to supply the market. And this is a direct quote from Saudi Aramco CEO, Amin Nasar, uh, which uh, happened this week. So think about it this way. Nasar said, Today, we have around 2 million barrels of spare capacity, meaning that um, if Saudi Arabia was producing uh, excess oil, then uh, if they get to the spare capacity of 2 million barrels, then there is nowhere else to store the excess oil. So the aviation industry in China uh, is 1 million barrels below pre-COVID level. So as the aviation industry picks up in 2023 to 2024, that's an additional 1 million barrels of demand. So consider China opening up uh, that will really add a lot of demand side. So when China reopens and there's a lot of demand, not just in travel, but also in manufacturing, then they could easily uh, take on the 2 million barrels uh, of spare capacity and there will be a shortage of uh, supply. And this is expected to drive prices higher. So during the pandemic in China, uh, we know that COVID-19 restrictions crippled travel, especially air travel, and a large number of pilots were jobless. And this is the current uh, biggest problem in China. They have a shortage of pilots. So the pilots cannot be rehired immediately. If you stopped your job three years ago, uh, you cannot be rehired. You cannot be allowed to fly a commercial plane, uh, mainly because you don't have the codification, the number of hours uh, that you uh, <coughs> you drove an uh, you drove an airplane over the last three, year, three years. So if you are pretty jobless, then you don't have the qualifications. Uh, you'd have to achieve the qualifications first before you are hired back for your job. And in that case, there is a structural shortage of pilots in China. So <coughs> the pilots cannot be rehired immediately as they don't have the minimum number of flight hours over the last three years. The problem is being addressed today and in the next quarter, and Chinese air travel should be recovering. This comes with higher demand for oil. So when Chinese air travel is back on track, then we expect higher demand for oil to be present in the markets, and this is expected to drive prices higher. So in a bid to try and solve the situation, Chinese airlines are tempting foreign pilots to come and work for them with paychecks ranging over $300,000 a year, and this is being given tax-free. And this is a big, big remuneration. So uh, <coughs> pilots from uh, other countries in the world uh, who have at least a thousand uh, hours, flight hours, uh, will get jobs in China. And once they do this, then we expect the uh, air travel market in China to start recovering. And this comes with a higher demand for oil. So <clears throat> the European Union also faces a similar challenge, uh, a potential shortfall of almost 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas in 2023. But this gap can be closed and the risk of shortages avoided through shorter efforts to improve energy efficiency, deploy renewables, install heat pumps, promote energy savings and increase gas supplies that IEA said in a report in December. So 
The biggest fear last year was that uh, Europe would have a tough winter, a very cold one that would require a larger consumption of natural gas. But instead, we had a very warm winter, uh, which uh, basically meant that they would be spending less uh, in terms uh, of gas. So they tried all kinds of uh, solutions, including importing gas from the sea, and uh, these uh, handled or helped them survive the winter. So right now we are on course uh, to get into another winter and uh, Europe still has not fixed its gas supply. So if this doesn't get resolved before winter, then there's that challenge that uh, inflation will be skyrocketing. So we saw inflation uh, <clears throat> a slight drop on the Eurozone, but uh, still very strong at around 9%. But then for the UK, there was a big spike uh, in the data that was read this morning with inflation moving higher to 10.4%, indicating that prices are still on the rise in the Eurozone. So this is a big, big challenge that everyone is uh, trying to figure out. And once we understand the overall macro, then uh, it, it indicates that there's a shortage of energy in Europe and it's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, as I mentioned, it takes a little bit longer. It might take one or two years. So over the last one year, we are not able to solve this. So it might drag down to a second, second year, and this would only mean even higher prices. So uh, I see there are more people who are joining. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to type that in the live comment section, and I'll be responding to that right away. So <clears throat> under the UK government's energy price guarantee mechanism, so we know that this happened, uh, from last year in September. So it's basically an energy subsidy, just like uh, we had uh, this in Kenya. Uh, we had a fuel energy subsidy. So for them, it's an energy bill subsidy. So the energy bills that are paid by the uh, general consumer are capped at a certain level, I think about 2,500 pounds. So if it's above that, then the government takes care of it. So the government has been doing this since September and it's becoming a big, big problem for their budget. So taxpayer money has been used to shield households uh, from the surge in prices that followed Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So keeping the current level of energy subsidies would cost about 2.7 billion pounds until the end of June based on current energy price forecasts the IFS estimated this week. So we know that in the next couple of months, uh, towards June, uh, <clears throat> the UK might stop uh, subsidizing energy. And when this happens, we will be expecting uh, both Brent crude oil as well as a natural gas to start moving higher since people uh, will be demanding this and they will not be having uh, sufficient uh, money for this. So there will be higher demand, and the UK has not yet solved the uh, supply side of this. Remember, they banned Russian oil and gas uh, that was coming from the sea, uh, and also implemented a price cap. So in this case, uh, there will be less and less flowing to the Eurozone, and more and more flowing to Asia, Asian countries such as Japan, China, as well as India. So that's uh, one key thing to consider in the energy sector. So as for the metals, uh, there's quite a number of things happening. Uh, we know that central banks have been rallying themselves uh, to buy as much gold as they can. And last year, they hit a record. So this oil demand is expected to continue this year. And uh, sorry, this gold demand is expected to continue this year. And if it continues, then we'll be expecting higher gold prices. So the politicization of the US dollar is uh, forcing banks into gold, while the Fed is making capital more expensive at a time when mines need to invest in growth. According to Randy Smallwood, president and CEO of Wheaton Precious Metals and the chair of the World Gold Council. So we know that this has been happening. So since last year in March, what we have been uh, majorly seeing is uh, <clears throat> central banks buying out of gold, especially the Bank of Russia, as well as the People's Bank of China, among other central banks. So the US also joined the race and started buying gold. And uh, one of the reasons this has been happening is because of the uh, weaponization or the politicization of the US dollar. So 
since March last year, the Fed was very aggressive in hiking interest rates, uh, moving them from 0.25% to all the way up to 4.75%. And these rise led to higher bond yields, but then bond prices really went down. So liquidating uh, your US bonds at par was a big, big challenge. And uh, the world was having uh, a lot of problems accessing uh, dollars for their economies. So one good example is that the Central Bank of Kenya did not have sufficient uh, dollars to honor its bills. And uh, the Kenya shilling was uh, consistently losing against the dollar, especially for the last 60 days. So other economies were facing a similar problem. The Japanese yen was losing to the dollar, the euro, the pound, the Swiss franc, Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, and so on. So all these currencies have been facing a big, big uh, drop against the dollar, meaning that the citizens of those countries would have to spend more of their own currencies just to buy the same amount of dollars. And this was becoming a problem. So a lot of central banks, especially in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa, were facing a lot of uh, challenges, and now they are looking to creating their own reserve currency that is not uh, backed uh, by the dollar. And in this case, they want to back it by gold, and this means buying even gold from the open market. So the need for gold, the original critical mineral as a store of value, as a measure of value, but a constant store of value in terms like this, has never been more apparent, and this was said by Smallwood, as we continue to struggle through this challenge of high inflation rates, I just get the sense that it's a bit of a house of cards that wouldn't take much to fall over. So everyone can recognize that there's a, that there's a big banking crisis in the US as well as in the Eurozone. And as this crisis continues, uh, we know that central banks will not go for cutting expenditure. Uh, Parliaments will not favor cutting expenditure because that's not popular. It will not give them votes. So instead, to try to solve the problem, they will most certainly go for printing even more cash, which devalues the savings of their people. So in so, in so doing, you find that the only fright uh, is a look into an asset that has the ability to store value in such times. And in this case, gold serves as a very good store of value. So we are seeing a similar path happening across the world. And as gold demand goes up, then it creates a scarcity. And this is expected to drive prices higher. So China, Russia, India, and now the US are in a rush to buy gold. The BRICS countries are going, to, uh, are going for gold reserves since they expect the US to socialize its debt by expanding its monetary base, which would devalue the US dollar. So as soon as Fed pivot on rate hikes will likely cause another gold price surge due to a potential further decline in US dollar and bond deals. Uh, this was said by uh, Tina Tang from financial services company, CMC Markets. She expects gold will trade between $2,500 and $2,600 an ounce. So we know that on Monday, uh, gold managed to hit above $2,000. Uh, having traded at about 2009 before dropping further back downwards and trading at 1941 today. So demand uh, for gold skyrocketed to an 11 year high in 2022, owing to colossal central bank purchases. According to the World Gold Council, uh, central banks bought about 55 year high of 1,136 tons of gold last year. And this does not account for what has been happening since January this year. So the higher demand for gold is expected to drive prices higher. So in late March, uh, Fitch Solutions predicted that gold would notch a high of 2,075. So remember last year, the high that uh, gold prices reached was 2,069. And this was uh, during the panic period when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and people did, did not know how this would uh, run out. So in the coming weeks, we expect gold prices to run back high and get to 2075, and this is close to last year's high. So the firm based that outlook on global financial instability. Uh, we have seen it happen with uh, several US banks collapsing, 
adding that it expects gold to remain elevated in the coming years compared to pre-COVID levels. So that's our one key thing that we are focusing on today. So the White House last year said critical minerals, and now this is away from gold. Rare earth metals, lithium and cobalt, are essential to our national security and economic prosperity. So remember, the tech has been the uh, tech industry or the tech sector has been the most uh, vibrant sector in the U.S. for the last a couple of decades. Has contributed a large uh, amount or proportion to their GDP, and they want to keep this going. However, they are currently facing challenges in accessing rare earth metals, uh, mainly lithium and cobalt. So lithium and cobalt are major uh, raw materials for creating uh, batteries, among other. Uh, manufacturing devices, but uh, electric vehicles uh, batteries are the worst hit by the these shortages. <coughs> so apologies. <coughs> so uh, the latest lithium mine uh, stand up in Iran. So we all know that Iran doesn't have very good relations with the US. Uh, this is one of just four countries that America has designated as a state of uh, as a state sponsor of terrorism. So apologies, I need to clear my throat. So according to the Financial Tribune, the Iran Director General of the Exploration Affairs said that Iran had discovered its first lithium reserve with about 8.5 million metric tons. So if Iran is not in good terms with the US, uh, then we know that uh, the export of this amount of lithium might go to other countries, and these may include uh, China, Russia, among other countries. So currently there's a very close relationship in terms of oil and gas supply uh, between Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, and India. So in this case, we could be seeing out of uh, these deals moving towards that side or towards the BRICS side. So according to the US Geo uh, Geological Survey, the top five identified lithium reserves are Bolivia, which has 21 million ton tons, uh, Argentina, 20 million tons, uh, Chile, 11 million tons, Australia, 7.9 million tons, and also China, 6.8 million tons. And that tells you a lot. So when you look at this chart, uh, what you are seeing here is that uh, we are looking at a chart where we compare the primary metal supply as a percentage of demand in 2015. <clears throat> so this is looking forward and trying to understand the amount of uh, metals that are available in supply versus the demand we're expecting in terms of growth. So for lithium, uh, it's uh, way high, uh, almost 80%, meaning that we don't have as much uh, shortage. Uh, the shortage comes from the dynamics of where the lithium is found. So if the lithium is found in uh, Congo, then you find that uh, Chinese, Ch Chinese companies are the ones that are getting a majority of it, and US companies are getting less and less. So for cobalt, uh, it has the biggest shortage, uh, under 20%, around 12, 13%. And this is going to be a big problem for EV manufacturers. For copper, it's slightly under 40%, nickel around 50%, aluminium, uh, slightly above 50%, manganese, slightly above 50%, whereas steel is very close to 80%, uh, meaning that oil, uh, iron oil is uh, in a pretty good supply. So this means that EV manufacturers that are planning to be in business uh, by 2050, they need to figure out a way of handling the shortage of cobalt. So this is something that they have to figure out uh, before going forward. So in 2016, a US owned cobalt and a copper mine in the Congo was sold to Chinese mining companies backed by the government in Beijing. So this was done in a deal that caused disquiet across the globe. Cobalt has been a key metal used in lithium batteries which are the heart of technologies ranging from electric vehicles to energy storage systems that are essential to a renewable energy future. 
As long as that remains true, whoever controls access to cobalt will have the power to restrict or widen path towards that future. The biggest producers of cobalt globally are one, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, producing 130,000 uh, million tons. Russia, uh, 8,900 uh, million tons. Uh, Australia, 5,900 million tons. Canada, 3,900 million tons. Philippines, 3,800 million tons. And Cuba, which has 3,800 million tons. So as you can see, uh, the mining in Congo is now uh, majorly uh, driving uh, this supply to China. Russia is in strained relations with the US. So all this cobalt uh, remains in uh, Russia and moves to the BRICS countries, but not to the US. And also Cuba has very strained relations with the US. As you might expect, this might not get to the US companies. So as you can tell, most of these countries have strained relations with the US and this remains a major challenge for US EV manufacturers. So in response, we don't expect uh, the US to continue uh, depending on cobalt, which is not in available in supply. So EV manufacturers are looking for other ways of using a different material uh, to handle the same business that cobalt co uh, handles. However, as per now, it's still a big, big problem. It's still a big, big challenge in terms of supply and we expect cobalt prices to be on the rise this year. So that's uh, one bet you could uh, bet and look for the companies uh, that could be consuming this. Uh, if they are majorly dependent on cobalt, they could be going down. And if any company comes with a tech that solves the, these, then their stock would uh, mostly skyrocket as a result of this. So, if you are a trader of cobalt, you know that um, scarcity breeds higher prices. So in this case, you might consider trading cobalt in the global financial markets. So this marks the end of the presentation. And now you might want to look at the major prices. So the area marked in yellow here was the price of gold just before the news about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, Silvergate, as well as our signature bank. So since then, you can see that gold rallied about 11%. So from this level uh, all the way up to this level, $2,009 per, uh, per ounce of gold, this was about an 11% gain. Uh, before prices raised about 4% uh, to 7% gain. So today, as you can see, uh, we have had a bearish week, uh, having hit this high on Monday. Tuesday moving even higher, and today market trading sideways. So this has led to this sideways momentum, and uh, gold prices were majorly erasing gains, especially after forming this head and shoulder pattern. So we all know the head and shoulder pattern here. So this was the first shoulder, the head, and the other shoulder, uh, which is a reversal pattern, and gold prices eventually dropping to a support level around 1936. So if you go to the four hour chart, you'll notice that this was previously a high, even on the one hour chart, if we zoom out, this was the high uh, that we saw on uh, the 15th of March. And now it has acted as a major support level and you're seeing gold prices rise as we approach the next announcement by the Fed, which is the FOMC interest rates as well as the press conference. So if you're trading today and you're in the market, uh, I will be giving you some time focus on what's happening in the markets. So once uh, you get to understand that, then uh, possibly take the appropriate positions or not. So <clears throat> today uh, being Wednesday uh, at 9 p.m., uh, which is 25 minutes uh, from now, you need to be, pre to be prepared for some uh, high volatility in the markets. And these will be coming from uh, FOMC economic projections a federal open market committee statement, uh, the fund threat, and 30 minutes after that, we'll be seeing the press conference. So normally, the way this happens is that the US announces interest rates, and immediately the markets will be reacting to the announcement of interest rates. So this uh, happens at uh, 9 p.m. So within the first 30 minutes after announcement, we'll be ex uh, experiencing some higher spreads in uh, major markets. But at the same time, some big spikes are expected, especially in smaller time frames. So 
right now the market is uh, pretty indifferent we don't know whether the fed will go for a rate hike a rate cut or even hold rates steady uh normally uh from the forward guidance we've been following since march last year we were expecting the fed to go for a 50 basis point hike and then the expectations went lower to 25 basis point hike but then uh since there was uh, this challenge with the uh, silicon valley bank then uh, the fed might consider uh, the health of the financial system and go a little bit slow or even consider cutting rates so we don't know what the fed will do so immediately after the announcements we expect the markets to react crazy volatility to be happening in us dollar pairs uh, gold silver as well as uh, brent oil and wti crude oil prices uh, what we basically call the US oil. And also we'll be seeing crazy volatility happening in the S&P 500 index, the Dow Jones, um, the NASDAQ 100, as well as uh, the Russell 2000 indices. So all these assets are expected to be extremely volatile uh, reacting to the interest rate hike, cut, or even holding rates steady. So 30 minutes after that, we'll be seeing the US Fed chair uh, Jerome Powell issue a speech during the FOMC press conference and also respond to questions from journalists as uh, journalists try to understand the monetary policy and the expectation for the next meeting. So this will be the most important part of the event as people trying to uh, try to understand what the Fed is looking to do to address the high inflation problem that is currently standing at 6% as per the last reading last week. So in this case, a lot of investors will be more interested to know what the Fed is looking to do, uh, what happens to the banking crisis. And once the Fed answers these questions, then investors will know the direction that the market is taking. So if I told you that the uh, US dollar is going up or down uh, right now, I would be lying and um, that's not appropriate. So we have to wait and see what happens. So it will be happening now in the next 22 minutes. So I will be looking to end this session early. So, now that we understand what we are expecting, I will go back to the charts and uh, show you this chart of gold. So if the Fed uh, considerably uh, decides to cut interest rates, then in that case, it would reverse the overall gains that the dollar has been making. And we'll be seeing the dollar crumbling down against other assets. And gold would uh, most probably spike all the way back to the most recent high on Monday. And this is a price of 2009. So, if the Fed continues hiking interest rates, then it still has to address the issue of unsecured deposits in the US. So if the Fed decides to print even more money to bank, to bank stop uh, the uninsured deposits in the US, then it will be a win-lose kind of situation where on one side it's raising interest rates, on the other side it's printing more money. So the Fed balance keeps expanding and we could be expecting some mixed reaction in the markets. So the most straightforward outcome is if the Fed cuts interest rates or maintains them at the same level. That would be very bullish for risk assets, including gold. So in this case, we could be seeing higher gold prices. Uh, the S&P 500 continue, could continue moving higher, maybe break this level and move even higher. And that's, that is a, if a rate cut happens or rates remain at the same level. However, if there's a, the opposite reaction may be some prices pushing back downwards. So for S&P 500 uh, from the one hour chart, uh, you can see that there's a trend line right here uh, indicating the movement uh, since around the 10th of March. So we could be seeing the prices moving further back down, downwards to this area. So for the Dow Jones, you can see it's also trading at the month reopen here. So if it goes back down, then it's all the way down. So this is a major news announcement. So we could be seeing the Dow dropping all the way down to the previous support. And if it rallies higher than in the one hour chart, we'll be looking at uh, 33,562 as the key target price level. So if it happens to drop, the bottom is around 31,439. 31, and for the NASDAQ, it's also trading at a major resistance level. Uh, it's attempting to break here. So a drop goes all the way back down to 11,806. And if it breaks higher, then the next target remains at this resistance level here. And this is around 13,641. 
So a um, key price level is expected to be achieved, especially after the data that is coming up tonight. And this is in 19 minutes from now. So for Brent oil, uh, made some good recovery on Monday, Tuesday, a similar thing. Today being Wednesday, we are approaching a key trend line here. Uh, that is around 76.675. So if the Fed goes for printing even more cash or lowering interest rates or maintaining rates at the same level, then the expectation is that the oil prices move higher and a key target price uh, will be around this region here. And this is around $82.9 per barrel. But then if it does the opposite, then oil prices could go back down and we could be seeing oil retesting uh, the low of $70 per barrel. So I think this is highly unlikely considering what we, we have discussed about oil today. So the higher likelihood is that oil prices spike higher and we see Brent oil trading at $82.9 per barrel. So <clears throat> it's just a matter of wait and see. So dollar index has been uh, extremely bearish for the last couple of days. So five days moving down was today moving sideways. And now we expect the reaction today uh, from the news. So a uh, rate hike uh, would uh, eventually strengthen the dollar. A rate cut would uh, eventually weaken the dollar. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, I've not seen any questions, so I don't think uh, there's any questions to answer. I hope you guys are prepared. So if you're not trading, just make sure that you observe, follow through the FOMC press conference. Uh, you can literally search that on YouTube, FOMC press conference live, and then go through it, understand what's happening in the markets. And then if you're not trading today, then perhaps tomorrow or on Monday, you'll know where to allocate your positions. But then if you're trading, if you're trading then you'll know the direction that the tide is taking in the markets and you will be able to swim with the tide. So that's all for today. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see you in the next session.